there. Gavin Gu here from UltimateReloader.com. I'm here with the man, Brian Litz. Brian, I read your books, and I'm a huge fan of Applied Ballistics. We've also got Chris Polka from Applied Ballistics. Thank you guys for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having us. We're, yeah, thanks for having us, sir. All right, so lots to talk about. So ballistics is something that you know long-range shooters really need to understand but it's a little bit intimidating and overwhelming at first. You know, a lot of guys, it'll be like, all right, I got a long range rifle, I've got some reloading gear, now what? And, you know, what I like about the books that you've put together is that they're very data driven and people can learn kind of the theory and if you will, the book knowledge and then apply that to their, to their everyday shooting. So uh, applied ballistics, tell me a little bit about that and tell me, Brian, a little bit about your background and what led you to become the chief ballistician for Berger and to do applied ballistics. Sure. Um, so my background, um, I've been passionate about long range shooting since I was a teenager. Um, you know, I went to Penn State for aerospace engineering because that's the closest thing to ballistics that's in, you know, mainstream offered. Uh, my first job out of college was for the U.S. Air Force. I was a contractor and we did modeling and simulation of threat air weapons. So mm. that's where I got the real background in applying modeling and simulation that, you know, there's a lot of differences between air weapons like missiles and, you know, unguided projectiles, but there's a lot the same too about how the equations of motion work. So I kind of, you know, and all throughout, I remained a competitive shooter, you know, passionate about Palma shooting, F-class shooting, and just driven to compete in those disciplines. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with a lot of the scientific and technical background from school and from the job, you know, I was able to approach shooting in a very scientific way. And that's something that not is not really pervasive in the shooting community always is the scientific approach, but mm -hmm. um, that's just how I'm wired and that's the way I've done it. And so, you know, I eventually um, worked for the Air Force for a few years and then made my way into the firearms industry as the ballistician for Burger Bullets in 2000, uh, I think about 2009. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, since then I've been designing bullets for Burger, um, most recently solid bullets in 375 caliber and you know continued in competition as well along the way i started apply ballistics first as a means just to publish my first book that mm -hmm. had you know measured performance data for a lot of the common bullets so that shooters had a common reference and didn't have to deal with the various standards being advertised from the different companies mm -hmm. um, so again trying to instill some some science into long-range shooting um, and so ballistics is the science of accuracy, right? Applied ballistics, that's what we're doing, is trying to bottle up all the stuff that's important for practical shooters to hit targets mm -hmm. and offer that in ways that, you know, are, th that you can make use of, you know, DVD content, book content, ballistic software that you can operate. Um, and it seems overwhelming at first, you know, especially if you're just getting into it, you're like standing there looking at a thousand yard target, like how in the hell am I gonna hit that target? Yeah. It's harder than you think. <laughs> So like with any big problem, um, you know, you can make some headway by, headway by deconstructing it into its parts. So ballistics, um, you've got internal ballistics, that's all your reloading stuff that takes the bullet from ignition to exiting the muzzle. And everything that you do with hand loading is affecting that part of it. Um, external ballistics is the flight of the bullet from the muzzle to the target. And that's where your trajectory prediction, your wind calculations, all of that, how much the bullet drops, that's external ballistics and it's a completely different study than internal ballistics. Then you have terminal, where you're looking at what the bullet does on impact. Does it fragment, does it expand, does it retain its shape? Um, so that's how I would suggest going about it as a new shooter is, you know, pick a topic that you're gonna work on for, the, for a time and focus on it, understanding that there's more out there in the different parts, but learn to hand load, you know, master the elements of hand loading and then focus on predicting trajectories, learn the tools to do that, and so forth. Just break the problem down like you would any other problem. Yeah, and that's that's kind of been my approach is, you know, the ballistic tools that we have available to us now are so powerful. You know, I've been sh using the Shooter app for a number of years, which is powered by your math mm -hmm. under the covers. And I've been totally amazed at, you know, at 600 yards, it'll be off by like an inch. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, that's amazing. And, and sometimes it's a little bit like a crutch too, right? If you see your shots shifting to the side or something, that's where for me, I'm, I'm still working through your book, The Applied Ballistics for Long Range Shooting. And to, to have some of that theory 
uh, is helpful because then when you see something odd happening, you know, you, you know scientifically maybe where to look and, and how to troubleshoot that. And the other thing I think is interesting about the book is how you, you quantify mathematically what's going to happen, you know, downrange. But then you also back that up with the Doppler data to take sort of the theoretical model and compare that against the actual empirical model. And then you know, oh, well, did something else happen? And tell me about some of the things that you learned gathering all that data. I mean, that was a huge exercise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, testing the bullets has, it's really about putting the theory to the practice, right, and in, to the test. And so everything that we do, all the tests, it's really a MythBusters approach that we take with a lot of the testing because there's, you know, everybody just knows something, for example, about hand loading. And a lot of people make decisions on that because it's the common belief. Well, you know, we challenge that. We put that to the challenge in the lab. We found that a lot of things that are commonly believed are not actually so. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they do apply under certain circumstances, but not everywhere. So that's what we try to ring out in the books is when and where do certain facts apply and when and where they yeah. don't so that you know a new shooter coming into it doesn't think they have to purchase one of every gadget in the you know hand loading catalog of things to have um, in fact uh, when it comes to hand loading there's actually a lot less that you have to do than most shooters think in mm -hmm. order to make good ammunition when i say good ammunition i mean ammunition that you can win major matches with certainly good enough for you know, recreational hobby type shooting. So yeah, and actually, some of my experiences with people that I have really respected echoes that. Uh, my shooting mentor, Jim Finlay, shot 6.5 x 47 Lapua, loaded all of his ammo on a Dillon 550, and he would he frequently would be stacking shots at 600 yards. And his mentality was, you know, I don't need to clean primer pockets. I don't need to weigh primers uh, unless you're going to some, you know, outer limits extent of you know, bench rest level accuracy. So, you know, my goal with my community is to, to guide them down a path where they're focusing on the factors that are really critical mm -hmm. to their success. And then, you know, uh, you know, things like neck turning, you know, when is that necessary? Uh, it might depend on your uh, chamber geometry, right? How the throat and how the rifling starts to engage, if it's more angled, you know, if the bullet gets guided in a little bit better, the free bore tolerance on the, on the bullet. So maybe they can understand their gear and then understand their ammunition and then, you know, work on a model that's going to optimize, you know, their, their success. The bullet seating depth, right? The jump, right? I know that's, that's affected by different things and maybe more critical in some situations than others. On that topic, what do you think are some of the things that people obsess on that they don't need to for, let's call it a thousand yard shooting? Right. So for a thousand yard shooting, um, a lot of the myths that people believe in practice today come from decades ago where components and equipment were not very well made and there was a lot of variation and stuff. And you were sorting bullets, for example, um, in weight bins of one grain or for example, or, you know, based to ogive measurements of five thousandths bins because there's 20 thousandths variation in that. Um, but in modern times, you know, um, manufacturing consistency is much better than it used to be and the components that we have to work with the the brass cases the bullets everything is just more consistent so but everybody still wants to try and apply those sorting methods when you're not sorting out bullets that vary 20 thousandths in based ogive now maybe they vary five thousandths but shooters still want to break that up into one thousandth increments mm -hmm. um, and it's it's really most of the time is not necessary you know, I get a lot of questions about, should I trim my bullets? Should I point my bullets? Should I sort my bullets? How should I sort my cases? Mm -hmm. And the answer to all those questions really comes down to how, what effects it has in your gun. Mm -hmm. You know, so my universal answer to all those questions is load them as best you think they should be and shoot them, use that as a baseline, and then apply all those various different sorting and trimming techniques and try and observe a difference you know if you if there's no difference in your group size between rounds with zero run out and rounds with five thousandths run out then don't worry about it mm -hmm. you know that's it'll save you a lot of time and money on tools um and it's really easy to do a test and prove something to yourself it's also important to know what effect you expect to see like 
for ex an example would be, you know, neck tension. All right, if you're worried about the consistency of your neck tension and you do a test to see, is it better if with this neck tension or that neck tension, you have to know what your measurement of better is. Are mm -hmm. you looking for smaller groups or are you looking for more consistent muzzle velocities? Mm -hmm. And a lot of shooters don't have a very well-defined idea of what they expect. And so they, they do tests that don't really answer the real questions they have. And so the, there's a lot of confusion and a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. um, but the good news is that it's really easy. It's way cheaper, cheaper and easier and less time consuming to do a test to answer a question for yourself than it is to just buy one of everything and do all that stuff Mm -hmm. supposing that it might matter, you know? Yeah, and I think like on the topic of requirements, if you're in a 600 yard window, your sensitivity to extreme spread and standard deviation is gonna be not as meaningful. Mm -hmm. But of course, that dispersion grows, right? The further you go out, as the bullet drops more and more, depending on its variation in speed and that kind of thing. So, you know, if you don't have a shooting range in your area that goes out beyond 600 yards and you're obsessing on some of those those other parameters, maybe your time is better spent elsewhere. Yeah, that's that's kind of where the, the value comes in the books. You know, we have the ballistic software is a great tool and you can use it and not worry about all the math that's going on behind the scenes, but it doesn't really give you any insight about what matters and how much, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. if you play with it a lot and you say, for example, you change your firing azimuth by 30 degrees, see how much that impacts your fire solution. And you, and you run those scenarios and play those games, you can kind of come to understand what things matter and what things mm -hmm. don't. You know, if you're shooting a moving target at 300 meters and you're thinking about Coriolis effect, or aerodynamic jump or some secondary effect, you don't have a very well informed insight about what matters in the moment. So that's where reading the books, it helps to, you know, you don't have to know math. The book isn't about exercising math equations. It's about understanding physically what's going on. And if you can truly absorb and understand physically what's going on, then in a shooting scenario, you you just will know what matters and what doesn't. You know, mm -hmm. you you'll know that this is a moving target. The dominating factor in my hit percentage is going to be getting the lead right and breaking the trigger correctly on mm -hmm. a, on a good hold. You know, get your drop correct, get your wind correct, and and your lead. I mean, you just you just kind of come to understand the things that matter when you understand the physical principles behind it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So Chris, you are the lab manager essentially, right? Yes, I am. Um, became the lab manager about six months ago now. Mm -hmm. um, my background, I was in the Air Force, I got into the long range shooting community, Did was in there for about nine years and then I got out and uh, heard there was an opening at Applied Ballistics and, and applied and been working there for about a year and a half. Yeah. So tell me about the data that you collect and how you make sense of all the data. Well, a lot of the data I collect is we do all the uh, ballistic testing uh, for uh, getting the BCs, mm -hmm. and we do everything live fire. You know, there's there's a lot of people out there that they just they can put the measurements into a program and they give them a roundabout uh, ballistic coefficient. But we actually do everything that we put into our books, uh, our apps and everything is done fully live fire. And we've actually transitioned to everything's being shot on Doppler radar. Wow. Um, once we do the live fire testing, we compile it all and then we'll come up with our ballistic coefficients um, and our custom drag models. And that's Brian we'll look over everything make sure it's good and then we just get it pushed to our cloud it's actually we've refined it pretty well to where if we have to we can actually shoot and have it on your new device within a day wow that's really impressive and it sounds like you <laughs> are really busy yeah yes we are i there's not a day that goes by where we're not working on some project whether it's uh like he was saying testing some of those theories in the MythBuster approach of, well, I've heard that a lot of people say this matters, say like you were talking earlier about weighing primers. Okay, well, let's see if it does matter. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but we'll run it through the test and come up with that. And then if we're not doing that, we're testing bullets loading because we do all our own loading. We just get the bullets. We buy them from, you know, we've gone to heart, or, uh, sporting goods shops and just picked up bullets there or order them on anywhere, Brownells, Midway, any, anywhere like that. And we load our own rounds or ammo and, and shoot it. So yeah, we're, we're always, always doing something out there. 
Yeah, and I, I like I like the approach of basically taking taking the learnings that you guys express in in the materials, but then it's always about seeing what's going to work for you in your rifle. But if you at least start from a good standpoint and have a kind of refined approach, you know, a good strategy of not just randomly going out and doing stuff, hopefully that leads to a good result. And that's one thing I wanted to ask you, Brian, was, you know, I, I've been working on different forms of load development. And I do, for my audience, I want to cover different topics. I don't want to just get into one rut and do kind of the same thing all the time. Um, so right now I'm shooting over a chronograph, I'm doing a 10 shot uh, string, and then I'm looking for speed nodes, and then I'm doing sort of an OCW around those speed nodes to try and get the right balance between what the rifle likes in terms of the dynamics of you know vibration and all that, and then what the, the internal ballistics like in terms of a stable speed node. But w what I would love to know is, if you think of a practical load development model, what would you suggest for people? The I bought the 6.5 Creedmoor and I have the reloading gear, now what kind of a thing? Yeah, so um, it doesn't have to be that difficult, okay? There's, I think that some people might expect a very long, complicated, detailed process for me uh, for load development, but honestly, and, and I've done that. I mean, believe me, I've done it all. I used to do all of it. Everything you can do to a piece of brass, I've done it. Um, and, but fast forward to more recently, the last major shooting tournament that I shot in was a World Championships, the F-Class World Championships in Canada in 2017. And that match I shot with ammunition. It was loaded on new brass that had no work done to it. Not the next mandrel, not sorted, not anything. I seated primers. I charged it with powder, carefully measured powder. I am very careful about that. Seated bullets, none of it sorted, just assembled ammo out of good components and went and shot a world championship with it. And I was third place in the world in that tournament. And I honestly don't think that my position could have been improved with more careful ammo. You know, it was that ammo shot half minute groups at 100 yards, um, standard deviations of about six or seven feet per second. So there were definitely guys at that match shooting smaller groups and lower SDs than me. Um, but y they don't give a trophy to the guy that shoots the smallest group in F class. They don't give a trophy to the lowest SD. They give a trophy to the highest score. That's how you get medals in matches is you score highest. So that's where you have to understand your objectives. If your match, if it's a PRS match, for example, and you're about hitting, you know, IPSC sized targets within a thousand yards, those targets are several minutes of angle large, so you don't need a quarter minute gun to hit those. If you get your gun shooting half minute, then that's small enough to hit every target in the field. The only reason you're going to miss a target is by having a poor fire solution, an inaccurate fire solution, or your fundamentals of marksmanship. I mean, it's a shooting match at the end of the day. Yeah, so I get that, and I like the half-minute goal, right? Why over-obsess on something that's going to be less significant compared to wind and compared to the other dynamics? But, like, in terms of getting to that, you know, let's say your goal is the, the, the 8 FPS goal and the half-minute the half minute accuracy. Tell me how what your process is to, to work that bullet seating depth, powder charge model, whatever it is. So it's a little bit different than, than you'd probably expect. So... I honestly don't really think that the load itself has a lot to do with the groups that you're going to shoot. I think the groups that you're going to shoot are driven by the rifle, how well it's put together, the shooter, how careful they are shooting, and you know the comment like how how familiar you are with the rifle. You know, shooters tend to think if I lay down behind a gun for the first time and shoot a group, well, that's what that gun's capable of. You know, a gun. I, I've come to think of, of rifles, precision rifles, as more like instruments. You wouldn't expect to pick up a guitar and rattle off a perfect song the first time you pick it up. And a gun is kind of similar. You know, you have to spend time with it. And yes, you can shoot a group the first time, but if you try hard and pay attention to improving, you're going to shoot a better group on the 10th group than on the first group usually. Um, so that's the first thing to be aware of when you're shooting groups is don't think that every effect on your group size is caused by your load because it has the shooters in there too. So honestly, I don't really have a, it, if there's one thing about loading that's going to affect your group sizes, it's usually the seating depth. I've seen definite correlations between seating depth and group size. Um, 
So the way that I develop a load, I start with a well-built gun, okay, by a gunsmith that I trust. I select components that are quality components, you know, Lapua brass, burger bullets, things that I know I'm not gonna have problems from quality. And, you know, my load development, the workup, starting with the, the load manual, I'll load charges in one grain increments until, now this is if it's a brand new cartridge, something I've never loaded before. Okay. If it's yep. 308, something that I have data for, I just load what I loaded for the last barrel and mm -hmm. continue on. Mm -hmm. um, but something new, um, start with loads that are in the book, go up in one grain increments um, until you see signs of pressure on the brass that can be flattened primers, smoked primers. If you measure across the case head, uh, expansion of more than a thousandth, a uh, thousandth of an inch, that those are signs of pressure that any reloader can measure. You don't have to have this, the instrumentation to know your pressure. Mm -hmm. um, so you work up until you see any sign of pressure whatsoever, back the charge off a full grain and a half or two grains. And that's the powder charge that I use. Mm -hmm. I don't do the detailed load uh, ladders and o optimal charge weight. I understand the, the principle of that. And I don't, I don't think that it's invalid. But I think with the heavy barrels that we use in precision rifles, whatever vibrations and harmonics go on, they go on a lot less with barrels like, you know, shorter, fatter barrels. They just don't seem that sensitive to vibrations in my, in my experience. So again, you're making the case for know your rifle, mm -hmm. know your ammo, and then pick a strategy accordingly, mm -hmm. right? The Thompson Center Compass, the $300 rifle with that, that plane profile. I'm probably going to think differently about that compared to the big heavy barrels that I'm working with. Yeah, true. I mean, rifles are sensitive to different things. You know, if you have a really lightweight hunting rifle, for example, you might find that it shoots the best groups with lightweight bullets because of the recoil dynamics. If you have a light gun, it's going to move more during recoil before the bullet comes out um, than if you shoot a really heavy bullet with it. You know, I kind of said that backwards. A light gun will move more and the lighter your bullet is, the less it'll move. Yeah. So it's all about re repeatable recoil, right? Because right. like you're saying, the barrel is going to move. And if it moves the same exact way every time, then you've got a decent group, right? Right. <laughs> and so but with the thing with precision rifles, they're usually over 10 pounds, you know, 12, 15 pounds, mm -hmm. maybe. And you're usually shooting quality components, heavy barrels, probably not terribly long barrels. And that's how precision rifles are put together. And because of that, they're built to be less sensitive to all of those minor little things. So you can get away with a lot more. And so for all the years that I've been competing in Palma and F class, that load procedure that I, I, you know, find pressure, back it off to a safe charge. I never really strayed from that. That's been how I've, you know, won a lot of medals in shooting competitions with loads that were developed that simply. And where I spend my time is on the range, learning to read wind, learning how to shoot the gun better, mm -hmm. um, you know, refining the fundamentals of marksmanship. Those are, I know that we're talking about hand loading, but I keep going off on these tangents to talk about marksmanship because I think a lot of times um, the effects of marksmanship get perceived as effects of hand loading. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that your average hand loader would be well informed to like think about that and not that hand loading isn't important you have to do a good job of it mm -hmm. but once you've assembled ammo that's consistent out of quality components it's on you to learn to shoot that as good as it can be shot i would say my experiences recently echo that so i built two 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 224 valkyrie rifles one a real heavy remington 700 bolt gun and one an ar-15 and when i went from the bolt gun over to the ar-15 it felt really really wobbly and i really had to retool my my technique and I found after a while my, th I shot at 600 and I had two groups that were the same size with both rifles and it was because I had spent more time around that AR-15 and was working more on my marksmanship and it was the same load. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah I mean the reloading is it's a fun thing to do and you know P and for years I also spent a lot of time learning everything I could about how to potentially make a better round and you know painstakingly made my ammunition like that and it's fun i mean it's easy to understand why hand loaders go to the lengths they do because they're we're dedicated we're passionate about it we want to make it as good as possible um but at some point if you step and stop and ask the question like is this improving my objective am i getting closer to my goal by doing this 
And the honest answer to a lot of those questions is it's not, you know, things turning case necks, um, uniforming primer pockets, flash holes, things, mm -hmm. they, um, th they don't make a measurable improvement on the result that you care about. Mm -hmm. You know, I've heard a lot of hand loaders that are very proud of how consistent their neck tension is. You know, they're like, well, when I, before I worked the brass, the neck tension's all bad, but now the neck tension's great. I'm like, all right, so what, how does that improve? Like, how can you demonstrate that that improves your shooting in any way? Did that lower your, the standard deviation of your muzzle velocity? A lot of people just assume that it does. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing a great job with consistent neck tension, well, your SDs must be lower. Must they? <laughs> I, they're not always. They're, how many tests have we been surprised right. by in the lab, Chris? That it's 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 amazing where you you know you we always go into a test and you're you're open minded, but you, no matter what you do, it's human nature. You're like, I think this is how it's going to turn out, mm -hmm. and I'm telling you, like ninety percent of the time, you go, huh. <laughs> like not, it, not didn't matter. Nothing mattered. It's uh, it and it's a lot of times it actually opens up more questions and then more tests just because you're like, okay, so what is going on and what does make this? What does make a difference? Yeah, and and this is what, why I think it's such a black art. The whole rifle thing is, it, you know, the bore makes a big difference. But then you'll get some of these economy rifles that shoot really, really well. The Thompson Center Compass I mentioned, the 223 version of that, 0.3 inches at 100 yards for five shots. On, on a rifle you can get on sale for $179. When I look on with a bore scope through there, there's a lot of tooling marks there. You know, it doesn't clean up as good as my match grade barrels. And the match grade barrels shoot well as, as well. So it is hard to, I'm, I'm surprised continually as well. You know, but uh, I do like the idea of starting fundamentally with quality components, knowing that you have a rifle that's likely to shoot well, start near max load. I talked to Ron Reber, the chief ballistician and lab manager over at Hodgden about that, and he suggested the same thing. Near a compressed load or a slightly compressed load is going to be consistent, especially when you consider, you know, your look angle and temperature variations and all, all the other stuff. So it's a good place to start, see if it'll shoot well there, and then maybe maybe get an alternate plan in place if it doesn't. So an interesting thing, I've, so there's a couple examples. I don't know, I tend to go long on interviews, but uh, <laughs> you, can, you can cut out what you don't like. Um, so on the fill ratio thing, you know, that's been one of those things that everybody's accepted, higher fill ratio, more consistent muzzle velocities. And it's, it's for sure that you can achieve consistency that way. Um, but Mitch Fitzpatrick had the idea, he's worked for Applied Ballistics as an intern for a number of years, and he's very keen on cartridge design and ignition and powder burning. And he said, you know, he said, he's, he supposed that if we had a low fill ratio of faster burning powder, that the consistency with which you can ignite faster burning powder would create a low SD. And so we tried some things. We tried, uh, for example, Varget in a 338 Lapua. Normally not a powder you would shoot in that because it's really fast, but we only filled it was 50 or 60 percent mm. and the SDs on that 50 or 60 percent fill ratio were very good. I mean, I don't remember at the top of my head, but I want to say it was 10 feet per second or less. Mm. And so the, the key to that was ignition, you know, so there are good rules of thumb like getting fill ratio, but there's also exceptions, you know, mm -hmm. to where if, the, if you have the right combination, you can achieve a result. Now, why wouldn't you want to do that if it has low SDs? Because the average velocity was quite low. There's less powder. You know, even though it's very consistent, you're only burning half of what that cartridge is capable of burning. So, you know, we wouldn't advise doing that, but it was a good demonstration of like, like Chris said, you expect 60% fill ratio, psh, that's going to be terrible for SD. And it made a great SD. Um, another example, and this, both these examples are published in the Modern Advancements books, I think volume one. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to study the effect of campering the flash hole, right? Everybody, know, they make those deburring tools, the flash mm -hmm. hole deburring tools. And the idea is that the flash will come through there more consistently and ignite your powder more consistently. So the way we orchestrated that test was we had 10 pieces of brass that we didn't do anything to, 10 pieces of brass that we campered the flash hole on the inside, and 10 pieces of brass that we campered it from the from the primer side. Yeah, yeah. Most people don't do that, but I was like, hey, you know, let's see what happens. Maybe it'll be better. And so we loaded them up, fired the 10 rounds that, had, that were not altered to get a baseline to see how much we improved. And the SD on those 10 rounds with unaltered cases was three feet per second. 
Wow. <laughs> Yeah, the standard deviation. So I'm like, at that point, like I'm looking at these other rounds, thinking there's no way they're going to be better, and, and they weren't. They were the, your typical, you know, six, five, seven feet per second. And now, I, that's not to say that three feet per second is repeatable every time. But what that lesson showed us is that you do not like in that case, we did not create the decisive benefit to standard deviation that we thought we would but it really didn't make a difference if anything it hurt it yep so sometimes your best intentions are counterproductive yeah, so I mean, how many guys have arthritis in their hands from turning to <laughs> thousands of pieces right. of brass with a deburring tool like stop it you know don't t i would say stop it do a test mm -hmm. do the same it's not hard to do do some with do some without shoot them over a good chronograph and convince yourself if if you still think it's worth it after you do the real test and find out the truth, then by all means do it. Mm -hmm. But you might just save yourself some <laughs> corporal tunnels. Yeah. Okay, so another question for you. You know, in your book, you talk about the standard projectile for G1, the G1 model, and then the the G7 standard projectile, which is like a, hull, a boat tail model. Why do we still have a bunch of G1 data floating around if that data is not really relevant for what most people are loading? Well, paradigms die hard, you know, that's, th there was a time when projectiles looked like the G1 standard, black powder cartridge bullets looked like that. Um, and before the days of high speed computing, there was a very good computational reason to use standards like that. Um, Cause you couldn't calculate every solution on a custom drag model. You had to refer to a standard. It made the calculations tractable. Um, and that's really the, the only reason why ballistic coefficients were used and continue to be used. Now, G7s are a much better representation, but they're still just a standard representation, a comparison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, custom drag models are better. There is still some utility in ballistic coefficients, though. If you have one that's decently representative of your bullets, like a G7 standard, um, that number, it makes it very easy to compare the performance of bullets, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, custom drag model will do the best job at modeling your, your trajectory at long range so you get the best dope. But if you want to compare one bullet to another and I give you both of their custom drag models, you really, you can't look at one number and tell. You have to run a trajectory with one, run a trajectory with the other, and then look at how the wind drift compares and, mm -hmm. and then there's velocity effects. And so it makes it very hard to do a comparison whereas BCs have a lot of merit in being able to like make comparisons between bullets. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, tell us about some of the new products that you've been working on. Right, so um, we've been uh, invested in ELR competition for the last couple of years. And, you know, we came at it like anybody else in the beginning, like what's the best out there? Now nah, we can do better. <laughs> and so um, in 2016, Mitch Fitzpatrick developed the 375 Lethal Mag cartridge. It was this long fire breathing dragon. And it pushed a 400 grain bullet at 3,200 feet a second. Um, super great performance, one matches with it, um, but we learned the hard way about the, you know, fouling effect and the velocity increases in pressure problems that we had with that. So we had, a, you know, an opportunity to develop a cartridge of our own for ELR shooting and for, in particular, for a project we're working on for the government. Uh, weapon systems, ELR weapon systems for the military, mm -hmm. and anything those guys use has to be a repeater, right, uh, from a box magazine, which means you're constrained on length. Mm -hmm. So we had to develop a cartridge that would be more friendly to shoot over a large number of rounds and also magazine feeding, and there wasn't anything available that did that. So we developed the cartridge, the enabler cartridge. Mm -hmm. Enabler stands for Engineered by Applied Ballistics for Extreme Long Range. Mm -hmm. And there's a 375 variant of that, which is sort of proportioned like a scaled up 338 Norma mag. So if the attributes hold for the larger caliber, you know, that's, you get a lot of round count before fouling, you know, it's very inherently precise, efficiently burning uh, uh, cartridge. And in conjunction with that cartridge development, we also developed the Burger Bullets, um, the 375 caliber solids in 379 and 407 grain. So those bullets in the cartridge were kind of developed together for the military application um, and we've been shooting them all year and they're very well proven now Chris won the first match with those bullets in April the world's longest shot challenge Wow! and, and how, how long was that shot uh, 2,680 yards <laughs> Wow 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what the design objective for this cartridge is 2,500 meters. Wow. So, you know, we last week we were shooting 3,000, 3,500 meters with it. It's very consistent. At ELR distances, no matter how low drag your bullet is and how high velocity it is, by the time you get out to a mile and a half or two miles, everything is transitioned through the transonic speed range and is now subsonic. So any bullet that you employ at that distance has to be transonic stable and predictable. Mm -hmm. And these burger solids are very much so. Wow, that is that is really, really impressive. And I'm actually interested in getting into ELR this year. Just starting out, I mean, I, on my property, I can shoot out to a mile. Nice. And um, it takes a lot of hiking. But uh, just, you know, I've talked to a lot of people that have shot at a mile. I haven't yet. And uh, it, it's not as easy as it sounds. And you need to be very prepared in terms of, you know, your understanding of the ballistics, your, your rifle has to be right, everything has to be right. Um, not to say that it's impossible or anything. Um, for someone like myself that's just starting out in ELR, what would you recommend for kind of a strategy or an approach to, to get started and not get overly frustrated? <laughs> right, so ELR is uh, an emerging discipline uh, in, in the shooting sports in the sense that there's, there's not a well-established uh, source of components and everything for it. And that's, where, that's what we're trying to do through Applied Ballistics Weapon Division by developing this cartridge that's very shoot, you know, you can shoot all day long, you're not gonna have problems with it. It's established, Peterson makes the brass for it, so it's, it's readily available brass. Mm -hmm. Burger makes the bullets, they're readily, come April, the Burger bullets will be readily available. Um, and Applied Ballistics Weapon Division, we have components in stock to build ELR rifles. Like if you ordered one now, we would deliver it to you next month. Mm -hmm. That's how, and that's been a big challenge. Anybody getting into ELR in the last few years, talk to them about how long it took to get their gun. Okay, so I'm starting to build rifles. And my question for you is, how available are the reamers? Who's making reamers? The reamers are available. Um, we're, we're not trying to keep the design of this cartridge secret. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we're gonna publish the reamer prints. We can sell you a reamer. Like we want to enable you to make rifles in this cartridge. Mm -hmm. And what, what uh, action do you need? Uh, Shytac length action. So we have we've built this on Lawton actions, on the Stiller 408 action, on the Kdex. You know what model the Kdex? Uh, the Shepherd, is it? 40. I think it's like 408 Kdex or something like that. It's the Shytac mm -hmm. length Kdex mm -hmm. action. So um, any any Shytac length, and it's a Shytac bolt face. So um, this works with those bullets at magazine length in any action that's made to handle a Shytac. Gotcha. So again, for me, getting started in terms of just mentally preparing and and going through the process of, you know, do I want to shoot at, you know, sight in at a certain distance and then shoot at 800 and then and then maybe take that and adjust my dope slightly and go out like what, what would you suggest? Don't psych yourself out. Um, okay. ELR is just an extension of standard long range. So do everything the same. Do your load development the same. Um, which in our case is a very simplified process. Um, so do your load development, shoot at 100 yards. You know, I, uh, one common misperception of ELR is that you've got to shoot at a mile every time. But in fact, there's a lot of value in shooting at 100 yards. Um, you verify that your zero doesn't move. You can verify that your uh, sights track vertically up a target and that you get the right amount out of your scope adjustments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of problems that people have at long range are really problems at short range and that they just don't see because they never shoot short range. That are amplified obviously when you go out there. Um, when, you're, when you're doing tracking tests for ELR, how far are you going in terms of mills and whatnot and then, and then coming back? So our tall target at the lab allows us to track, uh, we have it set at 100 yards and we can track 100 minutes of angle or 30 mils on that target. Mm -hmm. And so we actually do it twice. So we, when you get to extreme ranges, you need more than 100 mils or 30 MO, 100 MOA or 30 mils. So uh, we use the Charlie Tarek periscopes mm -hmm. that go on the front of the scope. I don't know if you're familiar with mm -hmm. those. It's a periscope that offsets the image coming in mm -hmm. by a specific amount so that let's say you need 45 mils to hit a target where your scope only dials 30 you put the 30 mil periscope on and now you dial up 15 in your scope 
and you can aim directly at the target that you need 45 mils for. Mm. Um, it's, it's a way around the problem for, you know, there's been different adjustable scope bases over the years that have been developed to kind of give you that extra elevation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that we have not tested one of those that has been reliably, repeatably consistent in returning to zero and shooting small mm -hmm. groups. Mm -hmm. um, but the Charlie, the Charlie Tarek, the periscope, it's, there's no moving parts on it. Once you get it locked down, you just, it's either on or off, and it provides a fixed offset of, of your aim point. So um, that's what we found works best for getting out to distances beyond where you can dial to in the scope. Okay, you got. I'm, I'm encouraged. Get everything locked in at 100 yards, which is what where my primary range is at. That's convenient for me. Make sure the the action isn't moving in the in the stock. Make sure the optic is tight. Make sure it tracks. Make sure I've got my load dialed in. Make sure I've got a good zero, and then just incrementally kind of go out from there. One of the one of the big things I think that a lot of people, especially getting into ELR and going beyond that 600 yard, that they maybe look over a little bit is actually how level is your scope um you're gonna you know a lot of people take for granted that if you put a a little level on top of your scope cap that that's showing you true level well now you're relying on the machining and everything else and make sure your gun's level and stuff but when we do it we actually you hang a plumb line yes. and line your reticle up with a plumb line because that way you're actually going to get the true zero or of that scope and true level and then actually make sure you're using a bubble level after you get it set i just i just started doing that for some of my scope testing and it was really interesting to see that some scopes are really well aligned between the housing and the the reticle and then others aren't as much but yeah it's you, you can't really take anything for granted you got to focus on the end result right <laughs> okay so last question for you brian uh applied ballistics is about materials but it's also about events right can you give me kind of like a high level overview of if people come to your applied ballistics seminar you know what that looks like what they get out of it and and what they can expect to learn yep so the seminars we've been doing a few years now we have uh two seminars a year a spring and a fall um and it's a two-day event it's all classroom and we have you know one hour blocks eight of them a day for two days and my, I personally deliver about half the content and the other half we have um, expert guest speakers from around the community that come in, you know, that specialize in long range hunting or like Amo always gives a, a block on wind reading. Um, so we have, you know, different aspects of long range shooting that get covered in a, you know, in a conference style, uh, you know, PowerPoint approach. And, you know, there's a lot of a lot of places out there that do live fire training, which we're getting into, I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but a lot of times the ballistics and the science don't get addressed fully, you know, on the range with the guys that have the questions, you know. So our seminars are really for the guys that really want to nerd out on the science of what's yeah. going on that have never gotten satisfaction from the for their questions anywhere else. Like that's this we try to make that the place where the buck stops. Like we don't know everything and we can't answer every question, but the people that come to those seminars, we have, you know, professionals who work in the industry, you know, if somebody has a question about, you know, producing ammunition on an industrial level that we may not like know, well, if there's a guy from federal cartridge company in the audience, mm -hmm. like you get an answer. So mm -hmm. um, the, the, the seminars are very rich in that kind of scientific information. Um, so that's one event that we do. Um, you can also see us at a lot of matches. You know, we shoot ELR matches. Uh, we have a guy that shoots F-class matches that, you know, can relay a lot of the his approach and how he goes about things through the lab. Um, and like I alluded to earlier, we're starting a training division where we're, you know, we've been getting a lot more requests for seminars than we're able to fulfill. Mm -hmm. And so we're starting a training division where we're taking that show on the road and having more adaptable different kinds of training events for smaller groups. The seminars are typically 70 or 80 people, mm -hmm. um, all classroom, but our live fire events are gonna be more tailored towards the audience. If you have you know, a group of 20 guys on a range that want our training, you know, we'll send some reps out, show you how to use the Kestrel, show you how to use all the different devices, answer any questions you have about ballistics, um, but it's not the academic level of detail that you would have at a mm -hmm. seminar. So. so if you go to the seminar, would you recommend getting the Applied Ballistics for Long Range Shooting book and reading it ahead of time? 
Well, if you sign up for the seminar, you get all of our books sent to you free. It's like nearly $600, I think, worth of, of media that you get. Um, all the books, all the DVDs, and a $200 ballistic software package that you get mm -hmm. to that has the weapon employment zone analysis on it, which is what calculates hit percentage. That's a whole, it's not as mainstream as I'd like it to be, but there's a very cool capability where you can describe your target, the range, all the uncertainties, and it will calculate your hit percentage on that target. Like what is your expected probability of hit? So we go over how to use all that at the seminar. So yeah, if you want to come sign up early and we send the books to you mm -hmm. and you can kind of study ahead. Okay. Well, I definitely have my work cut out for me. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to talk with me. And if you guys want to know more about Applied Ballistics, go to AppliedBallistics.com. Got a lot more SHOT Show 2019 content coming up. If you liked this video, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe with notifications. Until next time, happy shooting and happy reloading.